Uh, well, let's start. I'm Richard Layard, and uh, I'm so delighted that you've all been able to come. Uh, we've got an amazing collection of people here for what uh, we think of as a very important conference. And uh, we're really delighted at LSE to be co-hosting uh, this conference with the OECD and with SEPFAMAT in association with the What Works Centre for Wellbeing. Um, the OECD connection is, of course, crucial and has been over the years. And uh, looking back to my early life as an education researcher, <laughs> I, I remember there was a famous OECD conference uh, in 1961 with Tinberg and, and other great figures present, which launched the human capital revolution into policy and led to the great educational expansion. So OECD has played this role of thought leader uh, more than once before, uh, and it's terrific uh, that they uh, have taken on this uh, promotion of well-being um, as a goal of government. Uh, so we have high hopes for the conference, and um, it's, it's wonderful to have to start us off. <laughs> I think we all know that Gus, uh, former Cabinet Secretary here, is the policymaker worldwide who has done most to champion well-being. Uh, we owe it, Gus an incredible debt, uh, and it's lovely that he's here to start us off. Um, he's also, incidentally, the uh, founder of the Watt Work Centre for Wellbeing, which I'm sure he'll say something about. Um, so Gus is going to speak first, uh, then Martin, and then, no, hang on, uh, and, and then we are going to present, the three of us, the findings of our book on the origins of happiness, then, then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, and then we'll have coffee. Uh, but I have to do one other thing. I have to tell you that should the fire alarm sound, <laughs> leave by the nearest exit and go around the corner and up to uh, the, the area um, towards LSE underneath two big towers called Towers 2 and 3. The, <laughs> the other rather serious uh, announcement is there are no toilets uh, <laughs> on, on this floor. <laughs> And the ladies are on the second floor, and the gents is on the third floor, quite a far way along. Gus, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you. I've always been an optimist. So, so the way I put it is we know that exercise improves your well-being. Therefore, we're allowing for lots of exercise. Um, yeah, as, as Richard said, I, I, uh, my, my former life as cabinet secretary uh, we've just, we are just celebrating our 100th anniversary of the birth of the Cabinet Office. And in that, those 100 years, there have been 11 Cabinet Secretaries. Uh, I, am, I am number 10, right? So there's now number 11 in place, um, which is uh, quite good to be number 10 at number 10. I think it's quite cool. <laughs> um, uh, but, it, but it has kind of brought home to me. We had a, a celebration in Downing Street on Friday. Uh, just how things have moved on. If you think about 1916, the middle of uh, the First World War, going quite disastrously, and someone realizing that actually governments could play a role in bringing together society for a collective end. And that collective end in the First World War was, of course, winning the war. Really existential threat, if ever there was one. And it just shows you the power of government to do things. And... Uh, so the 11 of us, uh, the six of us still alive, and um, we have discovered that in 1962, all 11 of us were alive. We didn't have the prescience to have the photo, so that would have taken a bit, but um, especially since Jeremy, uh, my successor, would have been in a nappy, probably. So today I wanted to talk about the political side of this and the political economy, as it were. And I have to start with my former boss, David Cameron. Uh, David Cameron, probably now writing his memoirs, in fact, I know he is, uh, and presumably trying to explain why he held a referendum on leaving the EU and lost. Uh, but history might still look kindly on him for one of his first acts to begin the national measurement of well-being. He understood the difference between activity and results. Um, GDP is an activity measure, and even as its founder, Kuznets, acknowledged, Somehow we convinced ourselves that it was the important result. Now, 
Some people blame the statisticians for this, but I don't think they're responsible. They consistently reinforce the activity point by amending the defini definition of GDP to include activities that they can value in monetary terms. Hence, the recent inclusion of prostitution and illegal drug activity. If you still think it's a wonderful welfare measure, then talk to me afterwards. Um, so why use GDP as a measure uh, to guide our success in society? I think there's something here about thinking that activity is good. Uh, and I also believe it's a fear about grappling with the real question. And for me, the real question is, what's it all for? And that's the kind of question we could ask of ourselves when we get up in the morning. We could ask of ourselves in a business sense, what's it all for? Or we could ask ourselves in government, what are we trying to achieve? And that, for me, is the key question. Now, most philosophers and politicians would share a view that society should be striving to improve the quality of life of people and that governments should do the same. In other words, they should be striving to enhance, and this is the, the phrase I like using now, the long-run sustainable well-being of their members. There will always be objective measures that provide a guide to well-being, such as life expectancy, the measures of physical and mental health, but fundamentally, we're talking about a subjective concept, and therein lies its strength. It is a very democratic measure based on people's feelings, not something handed down on tablets of stone from the statistical office. David Cameron started the process of measuring subjective well-being in the UK, and the results now have the status of official statistics. That means they are tablets of stone handed down by the national statistics. Um, so at last, we can get answers to the question of whether well-being is rising or not. We know, we know things about the distribution of well-being. We know it by uh, quite fine areas. So we are starting, and this is why I think David Cameron will, will be remembered, to get the data without which none of us can do the analytical work that we need. Of course, once you've got the data, that leads to the next and fundamental question, how can we raise well-being? And I think just as important, how can we reduce inequalities in well-being? But thanks to the hard work of the OECD, and I'm delighted we've got Martine with us today, uh, we now have guidelines that all countries can use to get comparable measures and I'm delighted that countries like Germany, which we visited, Richard and I visited uh, as we were launching the Legatum Report on Wellbeing, um, that they are now embarking on this quest and have seriously done a tremendous work in asking their people what really matters to them and starting to get these things going. We will have succeeded when all political leaders start framing their manifestos to answer that question, what's it all for? And I'm Delighted, Martina and I were talking beforehand, that the DG of the OECD is now framing the OECD's goal in terms of improving well-being of the people. Once we start getting manifestos along those lines, and they start thinking about, okay, what does it mean? What, what kind of policies should we have? I think that'll be the next big success. And if, they've got, if they need incentives to do this, they need to look at some of the LSE work that shows that the relationship between uh, well-being and the fate of political incumbents, uh, it's, it's as you would expect. So let's talk, let's talk about what's really happening in the political scene in the UK at the moment. Everybody is wondering about how we leave the EU. Uh, the Remain case was mainly that leaving would damage economic prospects. The Leavers said it would give us back control of our country. When you look at uh, the US, Hillary Clinton argued that her greater experience would lead to better government growth, reduced inequality. Trump said he would make America great again. In both cases, uh, i.e. the UK and the US, and more recently in Italy, people are arguing that the results reflect, reflect the rise of populism. Yet one common feature is a feeling that the gains from globalization and technology are not evenly spread. To my mind, the answer is not less globalization or technical progress. Indeed, we need more to raise productivity, but better ways of spreading the gains. The gainers are not compensating the losers. For those of us brought up in economics, we know all about Paratian gains, but 
Actually, it requires an active government to think about spreading and the distributional consequences of all of this. In the UK, if you want one stark fact relating well-being to what's going on now in terms of Brexit, the greater the inequality and in well-being in an area, the more likely the area was to vote to leave. That, to me, is a pretty profound uh, res cause, uh, correlation. Not necessarily causation, I stress. But I think if David Cameron had used the statistics he created, he might have led to a better focused campaign to keep us in the EU. For example, he could have responded to the global financial crisis by using fiscal policy to enhance the well-being of the losers. This would have meant finding ways to help those with the wrong skill sets for the job opportunities that exist locally. Now, I'm very taken by the work of Richard Baldwin in The Great Convergence as to what kind of policy ideas follow from that sort of analysis. And I'd urge the politicians in countries like France, the Netherlands, and Germany that face crucial elections next year to study these policies very, very carefully and to look at what's actually happening to the well-being of people in their countries and to get ahead of this process uh, and to understand how to engage realistically and politically and practically with the losers. Uh, because otherwise, I think you will find that they will just vote against whatever it is they feel is the status quo that has led them to the position where they feel like they have lost out. So once this lesson is understood, the politicians will quite rightly be banging on our door, all of us here today, for more answers. If well-being and its distribution are so important, how do we influence them? That's why we're all here today, to provide the answers to that question. The work we are reviewing today goes to the heart of the matter. How do we improve people's health, be it physical or mental, their education, their economic prospects, and their sense of security? During my career, and I was in the civil service for over 30 years, uh, that debate was framed very simplistically in terms of how much do we spend on these different areas. I went through many, many comprehensive spending reviews or just spending reviews that lasted, that covered spending for one year or three years or two years or somewhat less at times. Um, and it was all about distributing the cake between these different areas, not really about how that money was spent. The great advantage of well-being analysis, coupled with advances in behavioral insights, is that we can get much richer answers to that what we should do, calling on a range of disciplines to find out which are the most cost-effective policies. Take one crucial aspect, education, and I won't go through them all. If you want to enhance long-run sustainable well-being, then help children to become more resilient, more fulfilled adults. That means focusing teachers and parents on the well-being of their children. Yet what do we do today? We spend all our time measuring exam results and have no idea what is happening to the well-being of our children. If there's one area where I'd say there is a no-brainer in policy, uh, yeah, num number one no-brainer was reallocating some of the health budget towards mental health. Uh, number two would be actually looking at education and saying, how do we improve the well-being, resilience, and character of children? Uh, and that's about teaching and about helping people with parenting skills. And once you look at those sorts of things, bizarrely enough, you start getting the answers that actually kids with higher well-being, better character and resilience and all the rest of it, turn out to do better in exams. So actually, it's not a trade-off. It's actually a win-win, as they say. So... Uh, at least now, with this work, we are, and, and the work that's been going on for a while, we are starting to concentrate on answering the right questions. So much, I think, of policy has been aimed at just answering questions which don't really matter that much. They have a very high so what content. So we are some way away from having all the answers, and we need to get far more resources devoted to these crucial areas of research. And again, this could be done quite easily by reprioritization. Re One great step forward in the UK is the establishment of the What Works centers. Evidence-based solutions are needed more than ever in societies that are struggling to understand what is true. 
This is not helped by politicians who deride experts. Um, so in this allegedly post-truth society, I really do feel that there should be a very strong pushback to say, let's really talk about evidence and let's really get away from these wild claims backed by nothing at all. And indeed, that seems to be some, a lesson that we need on both sides of the Atlantic. So this conference is being run in association with the What Works Centre for Wellbeing as part of its evidence programme, as well as the OECD, of course. The centre is unique in bring, being a vehicle that pulls together academia, government, business, civil society, and funding bodies to create an evidence base for what really matters in influencing people's wellbeing. Critically, it not only reviews the evidence, but it also gives practical guidance on how that can be turned into action. The Center has recently published reviews on the impact of music and singing, for example, for both healthy people and those suffering from conditions like dementia. Very practical examples of how you can make a difference. In the new year, it will be producing the results of a comprehensive review into well-being and transitions into and out of work because we know the impact are on well-being of being in a job. We are in a world where self-esteem and all those issues matter and we're, we're struggling with uh, how it is that people who, we, when we've got record employment rates, we've still got all sorts of issues. So the centre is an independent, collaborative enterprise supported financially and in kind by a wide range of sta stakeholders. Please look at what it's producing to see how it might help you or others that you know. And do also think about how you might help the centre with evidence, expertise or funding. If you've got material that you think is useful, please pass it on to the What Works Centre. They will help you publicise it and uh, interpret the results and put them within a wider global context. We've created here in the What Works Centre something that is world leading. Let's make sure that it flourishes and helps drive well-being to the heart of the way we run our society. Two years ago, I got together with um, Angus Deaton, just before he got the Nobel Prize, uh, Martine Duran, David Halpern, and Richard Layard to write a report for the Legatum Institute on well-being and policy. We tried to explain how to do such analyses, and gave examples in areas like mental health, communities, and employment tackling issues like loneliness, which I think now the societies as a whole are starting to realize are hugely important. And actually, if you're in a world where public expenditure is very tight, finding really sensible solutions to these ideas, which uh, involve, for example, volunteering, which I think is a hugely important aspect, uh, can be very, very useful. So uh, progress in all of these areas has not been as rapid as any of us would like. Ironically, uh, and I say this as the person that set up the behavioral insights team, uh, ironically, there's more focus on behavioral insights than there is on well-being. And I say ironically because actually when you look at all of the behavioral things that we put forward, the reason as to whether they're any good or not is do they improve people's well-being? So you get lots of kind of nudge people. They love the nudges. They love the idea of putting a sentence in a letter and getting in lots more money. But actually, when you start saying to them, let's, let's have this really focused where it should be, because this will tell us which nudges make sense. You know, there could be lots of nudges, which actually may improve someone for a short time, but actually, by not allowing them to learn, may not increase their long-run sustainable well-being. So one without the other strikes me as really really dumb, and yet one seems to be very, very trendy, and the other needs more support. Um, so, uh, I think we risk being distracted by the means rather than the end, the end being to improve well-being. So the presence of such an audience here today, looking around you, uh, fills me with hope. Uh, the political upsets we are observing on both sides of the Atlantic present an enormous opportunity for us to explain what is going wrong with our societies and how we can put it right. That is what it's all for. Thank you. <laughs>